Is everybody here? Yeah. Yeah. Surya, shall we uh, uh, begin? Please. You go ahead and introduce, then I'll introduce the speakers after we've done the introduction to the studio for the record. Yeah. So welcome everybody uh, to the second session of this uh, webinar titled Contextualizing uh, Our Times and uh, Looking Ahead. So uh, uh, as, we, as we have been uh, discussing, you know, just before uh, this moment that, uh, you know, uh, visualizing architecture uh, as an artifact has overridden the more fundamental and pressing uh, concerns that the humanity is faced with in this century. Uh, so, on one hand, architecture is very bound to the, you know, imagine, imagination which is in intellectual realm and things like that, but its productions are always rooted in the realities of every day that is the social reality economic reality as well as political economical realities uh, so uh, as, as uh, we talked about earlier this uh, this webinar aims to explore the intrinsic nature of the society as a reflection of its temporal context it also seeks to understand the role of various social technological and uh, uh, environmental developments in shaping its cultural expressions, uh, you know, where, where, you know, culture is a kind of, you know, we look at as kind of an all encompassing uh, assimilation of various developments in various fields. Uh, and anchored to its historical precedence, the present that is today is shaped by this societal context, as well as the aspirations of the future. So with this perspective, uh, the, the, the studio, which is called the quotidian realm, analyzes what are these every day that affect the architectural production, what are the concerns, and not just architectural concerns uh, of the site or images, but the larger ones, as we discussed. And through this seminar, intend to orient the students into thinking at various nuances, various aspects uh, beyond the realm of architecture that connect us back into the everyday and thereby again influence our design processes. Uh, so uh, now further, I would request Surya to introduce uh, today's speakers as well as moderator. Yes, Surya. thank you. Uh, so we are very happy to have with us uh, the, the seminar is set in three uh, in, in, in three panels, which is one, uh, the society and technology for whom we have uh, Dr. Luciano Cardelicio from uh, UNSW. And thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you. Dr. Cardelicio is a construction historian with a background in building and civil engineering. His research interest centers on the value of various kinds of expertise involved in the construction process, structural engineers, contractors, and labor as key contributors to making architecture. His publications gravitate around the following themes, the technical and the intellectual contribution of labor in non-standard buildings, construction globalization, and building defects as pedagogical platform to assess the value of construction innovation. Thank you, Luciano, for being with us. Look forward. Thank you. After, uh, Luciano will be Kanchi. Kanchi Kohli uh, is an he works on environment. Thank you, uh, Kanchi, for being with us. Uh, works on environment, forest, and biodiversity governance in India. Her work explores the links between law, industrialization, and environmental justice. Her research interests also include the implementation of biodiversity regulations in India. She has authored various publications, research papers, and popular articles. She co-edited the book, Business Interests and the Environmental Crisis, by Sage, I mean, publisher Sage India. Since 2004, she co-coordinates co an information dissemination service on forest and wildlife cases in Supreme Court of India. She co-edited the case for the commons, 
a six part e publication on the administrative follow up of the 2011 supreme court of india judgment on the protection of the commons kanchi regularly teaches at universities and law schools in india on subjects related to biodiversity environment and community development thank you again kanchi thank you so much no. then we have uh, with us uh, to speak on culture and society and uh, we have amrita shah amrita thank you so much uh, amrita is a journalist social theorist and writer well known for a pioneer well known for a pioneering investigations into the mumbai underworld she underworld she's worked for the time magazine edited features magazine features magazines debonair and l and has been a contributing editor with indian express she is the author of hype hypocrisy and television in urban india published by vikas 1997 and vikram sarabhai a life published by penguin viking 2007 she's based at the center for contemporary studies india institute of bangalore her most recent book is amdabad a city in the world uh, bloomsbury 2013 thank you thank you amrita nice to be here yes. thank you You're most welcome all this uh, will be coordinated uh, by our moderator uh, kaiwan kaiwan uh, most of you know uh, is also a, a common um, fixture amongst us uh, but i will have to do the formal introductions anyways kaiwan thank you kaiwan for taking this role up uh, kaiwan uh, Thank you, Suri. And after after Kanchi's use of the word commons, I like that use of the word for me again also. <laughs> Common. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you, Arjun. And that you are a fixer. <laughs> a fixer <laughs> or a fixer? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, it depends on how what you heard. Okay, Sudeep, I can understand now what you're trying to. <laughs> okay. Uh, is a professor and chair of Do I mean Kavan is a professor and chair of doctoral program at the Faculty of Architecture, Sept University Ahmedabad, managing editor of Domus India, the India edition of the International Design and Architecture magazine. He studied architecture, literature, and Indian aesthetics and cultural studies. Authored Alice in Bulashiva, navigating a Mumbai neighborhood, and also wrote on the architecture of I M Kadri, and is currently working on the architecture of Saint Kapadia. he co-curated two national exhibitions on the state of architecture practices and processes in india the state of housing aspirations imaginaries and the realities in india besides other exhibitions independently on design histories in india or on mumbai as a shifting city today he has been teaching since 1999 across universities research institutions and para academic spaces developing curricula and theories and histories of art architecture and design He was the jury chairman at International Residency Program in the Arts, Humanities, and Sciences at Akademie Schloss Solitude, Stuttgart, Germany, 2015-17 and 2017-19. Thank you, Kevin, and we look forward to a wonderful uh, time here, discussing, talking, having a good conversation. Thank you once again. So please, uh, Kevin, it's over to you, and to Luciana to start. Yes, so I, I guess we just start with the speaker presentations in the sequence, and then we'll come to our series of conversations. Luciano, please. Yeah. Perfect. Luciano. I, I I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, I think I need to be able to. It says a uh, host disable participant screen. I need to be a Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So can you all see my presentation? Okay, perfect. Um let me start with the time as well. Uh so thank you um first of all, thank you um Professor Kakani, thank you um Professor Bat for uh, inviting me. uh this very interesting seminars it's it's a great um um occasion for me to uh, order a little bit of um uh, some ideas and some research findings i've been working in the last couple of years so these uh, talks are always very useful uh i hope they will be useful for the students but definitely are useful uh, and will be useful for me 
Um, so my talk today is uh, about um, construction innovation and the role of, uh, of labor. This talk stems out of uh, a, a wider research project I've been uh, dealing in the last couple of years on building defects and particularly on building defects of non-standard buildings. What I'm talking about non-standard buildings, I'm talking about complex buildings for a uh, geometrical uh, solution, for a complex design narrative and the way uh, they are uh, making and uh, often this, they are made and often this uh, complex uh, buildings uh, um, show an accelerated uh, decay, uh, defects and as a researcher I've always been interested in understanding why. Why these buildings that are being designed by very famous and international renowned architects are actually falling apart most of the time. So um, what I'm, I in my research I identify four major reasons why these buildings are affected by premature decay and this conversation is it's uh, stemming out from um, what I think is one of the uh, key issue of uh, contemporary buildings and contemporary practice uh, in, uh, um, in, the, in the globalized world of construction, which is an imbalanced relationship between design and available uh, uh, skills of the labor. So from a student perspective, I think today what I'm going to discuss in this 15 minutes, it's about asking yourself, okay, when you design something, who is going to build what I'm designing? Who is going to build what you're designing? Often from, an, from a student point of view, we address technically um, the question of how, um, how I'm going to build this or uh, how the building is going to stand up or what type of material I'm going to use. But rarely, in, uh, we ask ourselves who is going to build, what type of information like that are important, and I'm trying to convince you that are important to feed the design narrative as much as the other question I just, uh, I just outlined. So forgive me, this is a very rough graph. I'm playing uh, with words here and I'm playing with the order. So this is, a, it's, 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 it would be nice to have your feedback on this as well. But the point of uh, my talk is that if we, if we can really find a good balance between architectural design and the available labor skills that, um, that, that they are available on the market in the uh, place where you are designing, this uh, very fruit, um, this relationship relationship can be um, a balanced relationship or can be actually an unbalanced relationship. And I'm going to show you some example for both of this um, uh, group. Uh, the, uh, the balanced relationship when architectural design is driven by the uh, awareness of uh, the labor skills and it's a, it's a very integrated process and narrative, that balance can actually create innovation. And it's an innovation that affects uh, society, uh, the economy, the health and safety and the education. Uh, in the education sector. And I'm going to uh, a bit more detailed in a couple of uh, slides. So when uh, I often, uh, I always talk through buildings. Uh, buildings are the best uh, language I know to uh, demonstrate or to show what I, um, what I want to, uh, my argument. Um, so when, when I talk of a balanced relationship between available labor skills and architectural design. I all, always show this building, which is a building in Italy. It's a ceramic factory designed by one of uh, the apprentices of called Paolo Soleri. Uh, design in, um, is an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. This is one of the few examples of organic architecture in Italy. Um, this is a ceramic factory and the facade of this ceramic factory is actually made out of vases. So what is the uh, link here between labor and, uh, and, and design narrative? The, the fact that the architect actually engaged with the client and together decided that to use the employee, um, the employee of the ceramic factory. So to create the material to finish the construction. So there is a kind of like a, um, a synergy between architectural design and labor that to me it's, uh, um, it's, it's the most important uh, in, in this building it's quite, um, it's, it's quite, straight, it's quite straightforward. Um, 
why also, and I'm trying to explain all the words that, and, and what they mean for me uh, in the graphs I just showed you at the beginning of the lecture, uh, why is also important to talk about innovation? In, uh, um, I'm sure you're aware, but um, this graph shows, and we all know, the construction sector is one of the most reluctant uh, sector in the, uh, any country to embrace innovation. Um, so there is a, a rigidity in embrace innovation. We still um, assembling things together. We still um, working with exactly the same materials, um, and and there's a very little um, uh, there's a very little innovation embraced in the construction sector. So um, this is why it's important to because you are the next generation of architects, young architects, to understand that actually design has a huge power to embrace and, and empower innovation into the construction into the construction industry. The third element I just wanted, the third definition, kind of like I want to outline before getting in the focus on my argument, uh, is that when we talk about construction industry and, and the labor, the type of labor, we always need to define two major groups. The, uh, the first one is um, craft-led uh, construction industries, um, which means that um, there's a, an intensive use use of laborers, a lot of people on, on site. Uh, there's a very little level of mechanization and the majority of the task happened on site um, and, and it's about assembling little components, uh, little components together through the use of the intensive labor. Often this type of uh, industries are reflected uh, with a very little, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, big uh, construction companies and a lot, the majority of the medium size uh, or small um, companies. Uh, the opposite group, it's an industrialized construction industry. An industrialized construction industry sees a, a huge um, um, use of prefabrication the construction site becomes a place where big components, pre-assembled off-site, are assembled together. Uh, the labor is skilled, and, uh, and there is a very little um, labor used uh, on, on site. So bear with me, trying to uh, summarize in the back of your head, uh, remember what I just said about the, the, the relationship between labor and um, labor and architectural design, this differentiation uh, of construction industry and uh, the role of, uh, and the lack of innovation. So let's put all these things uh, together and uh, let's uh, try to argue why a good balanced um, relationship between architectural design and labor can be fruitful for innovation. So in order to um, get my point across, uh, I always use what is my major interest, which is a, the, the value of non-standard buildings. Non-standard buildings, um, historically, we can date the, the, this new generation of buildings uh, back to 1997 then what we call the Bilbao effect with the opening of the Guggenheim design by Frank, uh, Frank O'Gary in, um, in Spain. And uh, what, what is really interesting about this building is that this building has a value beyond their building themselves. Because um, you, these are buildings that are not uh, built with solution from a catalog. They are built from solution that are bespoke. And just by having a solution that are bespoke, they can create innovation into the construction industry. And that innovation can have a long-term value that extend the actual design of the building. I'm going fast here, but I'm in this slide, you can see three good example where the innovation is carrying on um, in, uh, and it, it doesn't stop into the building. For instance, the Maxi uh, design in Rome by Zaha Hadid, which this big uh, panels in, in reinforced concrete. Uh, the outcome of this, the long-term uh, outcome in the market 
um, of this building was uh, a new um, a formwork system designed to allow the big quantity of concrete to be cast at the same time. That solution was bespoke for this building and now is on the market, is available on the, on the, on the market. The concrete has been customized for this building in order to have a certain quality. Now how the concrete is on the market and that creates as you can see in a little diagram that creates an economic innovation uh, societal Im impact uh, in terms of economy the opera house the value of the opera house is still extends today you can see uh, in this graph um, that uh, how many companies uh, in the construction industry have benefited by the fact that the, the Utsun didn't know how to build uh, his shells and the fact that a construction industry that was uh, in the 50s just emerging after World War II start developing and so uh, you can see from this graph how many companies actually uh, were founded for the Opera House, worked for the Opera House and then carry on um, having a, a huge impact, uh, a huge economic impact that, that again extend. Uh, this is the first time uh, the, the building, um, uh, the, the first time like some uh, resigns from e epoxy um, glue has been used to connect precast concrete. This was exactly the first time now is a uh, is a practice um, uh, is widely used in practice in construction industry and the other good example is this other building in uh, Sydney designed by uh, Frank Gehry this building with this facade with brick layers uh, the brick layers were upskilled the the the, the um, very interesting side of innovation is uh, more about educational so the design, the power of design in this case had a long-term value because all the people that worked on the site have been upskilled thanks again to the design. I'm not a huge fan of the design, but I'm just, I want to highlight that often we, we don't see, we don't analyze this connection, this long-term value of some uh, design, design uh, choices. Um, so let's, so this is a deposit, so this is where the I think where the relationship between architecture design and labor is a pro, is a fruitful balanced relationship. Let's see a couple of examples where this it's not um, it's unbalanced and harmful, which in my opinion is one of the reasons why we see building defects and also a huge problem of health and safety in this particularly uh, uh, complex construction. Look at this picture. I, I, in, in, uh, this is a, a westernized uh, project. It's, a, a, what, it's the water cube for the, in Beijing for the Olympic Games 2008. You can see that the language, the architecture of the, lang the language of architectural design and the labor, the local labor is completely disconnected. And why you can see by this picture, because you can see that the object is a, a very heavily engineered, a structural engineer object that is actually is being assembled by an intensive use of labor with a very craft approach. Can, you can highlight how um, labor intensive is the site. There is a false work made in in uh, in timber. Everything it's um, um, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the the scaffolding is a traditional. There's nothing that um, link the uh, westernized and evoluted kind of um, heavily engineered. Um, appearance design with the with the way it's been built uh, things like this what I call superimposing design like a, a language that um, impact on a construction industry without really realizing what type of labors you have uh, creates this so this is the Quanzhou Opera House in China. I have been there in 2017. This is a picture I took myself. And, uh, and there is no surprise there that the language of, of uh, the design hasn't been carried on without actually asking who is going to build this. Um, same thing happens in, uh, in, in the same project in Rome. Uh, there's a very complicated 
uh, roof structure made with lamella for brisolet purpose in a glass structure. Uh, um, it's ridiculously, you see how many um, components in this detail you can see for this roof. And this picture show you how ridiculously this very complicated roof has been assembled piece by piece on site. Uh, we have with very little prefabrication, with a little control of, uh, of, and, um, of the quality. That's why it rains in this museum, and that's why this museum often is closed. Uh, it's because the, the way this building has been engineered, it's, it's been designed, did not reflect the fact that Italy is one of the country where the construction industry, it's very intensive, it's very craft-led, and there's a very little culture of prefabrication, as you can see from this, from, this, from this picture. And, I mean, I can talk about this, but my time is up. So uh, there's uh, um, uh, other case studies from very well-known architects like Richard Mayer and, and uh, um, Santiago Calatrava, who all, I think, made the same mistake of not considering the skill of the labor at the core of their presentation, at the core of the design. Uh, and another issue uh, and of this um, uh, unbalanced relationship is uh, in terms of health and safety, uh, where I, he, I, I read that Zaha did I have nothing to do. She thinks that she had nothing to do with the workers. I, I disagree because it's, it's down to design. It's always down to design and the way uh, this uh, information about labor are actually embraced in the design itself. So this is my final slide. I just want to unpack for the students the first question which is who is going to build what you are designing I think it's it can be unpacked to a set a sets of questions that I leave there and they, and I think as a new generation of architect you always have to ask yourself as soon as you sketch something so if you are embracing uh, innovation what uh, if are you aware of the available skills of labor is your design going to stimulate some economic sector things like that I leave it I leave it there and I'm done thank you Thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Thanks. Thanks so much, Luciano. Thank you. I'll stop Please sharing. Stop. Yeah, stay. And Kanchi, maybe get in with your presentation. Sure. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll first start talking and somewhere in the halfway down, I'll uh, share a few slides. So sure, they might sure. abrupt. Um, so yeah, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Uh, um, and it's a nice, uh, especially the question answers that follow after we, uh, you know, we shared our thoughts. Uh, what I'll try and do is uh, really talk about uh, when I'm, uh, you know, when we're talking about the environment, uh, concentrate much more on on lived environments and lived environments, which uh, which I'll try and uh, get to, uh, and what I mean by it. Uh, so very broadly, uh, you know, I think uh, environment as a word is you know, understood in many different ways. Um, and uh, it, it could be understood by association uh, in terms of a tree that you've planted or, you know, big flagship species like tiger or, uh, you know, a favorite wetland where you might have gone for a picnic or, you know, uh, uh, where it's important for water recharge or those kinds of things. And the big, big notion of climate change, you know, I mean, uh, environment is... I mean, in many ways, it's, it's by association that we're talking about. Environment often is also about, uh, about a space, a place, you know, uh, uh, a village that you, that you might associate with, or the beach that you might go either fishing on or, or you know, out with friends or for a holiday, or the Himalayas where you go up trekking. Uh, that's that's uh, you know, how you associate with the idea of environment or a waterfall, you know, uh, that uh, is majestic or, uh, or where it also has recently become a recreational spot. Uh, environment also for, for a lot of people who are uh, associating with the idea of environment, it's, it's also about, uh, in more, for, for a long time, it's also about issues of impacts, of justice, uh, things like, uh, you know, you, 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 you enter the environmental space by looking at waste, plastics, 
you know uh, so bad air or something like that so it's the impact that that is that kind of uh, that kind of you're entering the environmental space with uh, but then you know in uh, because i've worked a little bit on uh, law regulation and not being a lawyer but <laughs> being in the environmental space uh, there is there is a legal definition of what is environment uh, and there is a you know uh, it defines uh, you know there are there are certain laws which are specifically on special uh, on particular natural resources but the overall umbrella legislation of the environment protection act defines environment and in fact defines environment with all these elements as well as uh, the human association with the environment so you know embeds the human being very much in the midst of uh, what is considered to be environment and then it goes on to because it's a regulation it's a law it goes on to sets the limits and terms of when environment as a resource has to be used uh, uh, who can use it how can you use it uh, what processes should be followed when you use it uh and in a whole bunch of a bunch of a manner of uh, you know clauses etc that it puts out uh so there is one on the one hand the use and the other, on the other hand if you need to protect it what what all should happen again the same hierarchies of uh, who can decide uh you know where all can this happen so this this inter interplay of uh, you know uh, the in, in some ways the political economy of how regulation is uh, Uh, you know has is enforced really is is where uh, the question the interactions of uh, lived environment really comes in i'm uh, i hope through some of the examples that i shared what i'm saying is will be uh, uh, will be elaborated uh, you know uh, in, a, in a more in a de- in some more detail but now if if one has to look at uh, the regulatory spaces and i'm i'm coming from the environment regulatory space much more uh and you try and apply it on the broad canvas canvas of lived environments you know uh where pe- you know geographies have been created up for after a long standing of long standing human histories and associations with those places whether it's urban or rural and in many ways the lines between uh, these spaces and geographies are blurring uh so for instance uh uh we know that both urban and rural uh, spaces are highly stratified with class caste gender religion uh, and this my point first point is that this stratification really has and continues to uh, determine uh, human access to uh, what is a clean environment uh, water air uh, you know dense areas versus open spaces all those kinds of things number 2 what i want to uh, flag is that urban areas are uh, are now merging as we all visually also see merging with uh, peri urban and rural areas so the you know the boundaries there are also kind of getting blurred and that this this uh, this uh, footprint of uh, either rural areas coming towards urban areas or urban areas moving towards rural areas has has footprints on on lots of uh, uh, places which would otherwise be left without too much uh, use for instance flat plains uh, you know uh, say the yamuna river flat plains are being built over to have a art of living concert or for that matter uh, the big controversy in mumbai right now of the ra uh, forest where they want to construct the metro shed uh, you know which is which is actually these are areas that are somewhere in between urban and rural spaces uh over that matter the big controversy and there are many more like this uh, uh around uh, say the construction of a highway through the arabali forests uh, you know between delhi and gurgaon uh, you know in the national capital region and this is not a natural forest this is a forest that has been planted by people uh, has been developed over last 20, uh, 10 20 years you know it's been nurtured so the associations with that are, are extremely different uh so this this is the second kind of blurring boundaries the third is uh, also around uh, you know uh, so many industrial geographies that we know of, of which where lived environment is actually created so these are around cities inside towns you know towns have actually really developed around these industrial geographies uh, there are adjoining just adjoining villages because of some siting guidelines they don't allow you to fully enter so this interplay you know in many ways 
what is happening is you know these places are being seen because they've at some point of time become industrial areas or they can be seen as very important hotspots to create special industrial zones or you know where it's a perfect spot to actually locate a landfill to carry garbage from uh, urban areas and you know uh, have a wide uh, big mountain of uh, waste in those places so these are these are the kind of things that that uh, you know that you see around uh, uh, around lots of urban areas and rural areas where these these boundaries are blurring uh, the fourth point that i wanted to uh, flag up front is this thing about uh, many rural areas uh, and many lived environments in these rural areas are being uh, developed from being backward areas so they need to be brought in to the uh, the space of development to the economy and many urban areas are being redeveloped so we are actually in a space where there is both development as well as redevelopment taking place in all these places that we are talking about so for instance when you talk about areas being developed you see you talk there is justifications coming in saying that you need to create uh, you know uh, the laws and policies justify saying that uh, we need to create more jobs through uh, the sectors like mining or you know infrastructure development in these areas because these are backward areas and they need to be brought in uh, to formal economic spaces uh, or, or manufacturing facilities have to be set up uh similarly in urban areas you see enough and more examples of saying that what was is is not good enough and uh, and we need to bring things down and uh, and redevelop these areas now the reason i'm actually saying this so i mean there are so many examples which you all all also know about for instance uh, the the sabarmati river front was in many ways a redevelopment project that we are seeing in uh, in amdavad the whole controversy over the central vista redevelopment right now in new delhi is a is a is a uh, well, you know there's be parliament a common secretariat uh, the government many government offices is a redevelopment project of the city because there is already an existing uh, uh, use of that place so in in each of these places what is happening is that uh, you know lived environments in these places are being seen and understood as either they are seen approached as being empty spaces or they have to be emptied out to create new spaces so for instance either it's like you know uh, it's termed uh, as is things are you know like uh, these places will be termed as unproductive wastelands you know or uh, you know the politics about how you frame these uh, these areas uh, 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 would be would actually determine easier access to these spaces so either so, so you know it's almost like these are not good enough these places are not good enough so you need to actually develop them or what has been developed earlier needs to be fully demolished cleaned up and only then a new form of development that is that is taking place will will happen so in both these you know in both in the, the mind frame is either the, the canvas either is already empty or it needs to first be emptied out and you can't really build and navigate around it now for from from the ecological point of view this becomes uh, an environmental point of view this becomes a big big uh, big set of issues that you need to deal with because you're dealing with existing rivers you're dealing with trees you're dealing with forests you're dealing with open spaces that have been uh, created and they have to be emptied out you know they have to be emptied out or for that matter if you're talking about a open piece of uh, recreation or cremation ground next right next to a village they it's imagined as being empty so that you can actually put a you know plot a economic zone or a or a landfill right there so it's you know nothing else should exist there but what is happening is something like regulation uh, and which is where i started this whole thing uh, this discussion as well environment regulation or urban planning regulation uh, and institutions are actually really playing catch up to these realities they are not geared up to uh, to respond to both i would say that with both with urban planning institutions and regulations of which i have lesser uh, understanding uh, it's growing uh, gradually as i'm uh, interacting with these spaces and environment regulations are actually really playing catch up uh, and they have not i i mean i they have not a they have not come up to speed by design 
but actually this is also there is a politics behind it because you do not want to uh, get regulation to come up to speed and there is a resistance uh, to that there is a resistance to the extent that uh, what does it mean are are tree re related regulations you know uh, tree planting and tree felling related reg regulations were never designed to uh, to be able to deal with large scale tree felling 10000 20000 40000 trees in urban areas you know because they are they now forest uh, these these uh, areas that are not regarded as uh, forest but are urban parks etc which might be dense uh, tree cover they need to be felled tree acts are not designed to be uh, to be able to respond to that so the procedures are not laid out like that uh, our impact assessment environment impact assessment norms which many of you might know about actually uh, were pushed through especially for the uh, area development and building construction uh, projects with the argument that building and construction sector is actually should not be treated as an industry uh, because it's non polluting so uh, you know they were it was pushed through saying that uh, with presentations with the highest offices of the prime ministers uh, of the prime minister back in 2005 saying that uh, the only pollution from construction is human breath and the only effluent is human waste and this is on record submissions made based, based on which we have the design of our regulation today environment impact assessment regulation which does not require a full fledged uh, environment impact assessment for building construction and uh, projects it does definitely does not require any public participation you don't need to take uh, you know uh, ask people before doing anything in those empty spaces that we are talking about similarly there are uh, you know we have construction and demolition waste rules that have come up but where does where does that go where is it actually located which are those sites uh, and what uh, what is it actually changing when it's actually dumped in some of those places really comes up and finally the government's uh, you know the the regulatory answer uh, to all these problems that are raised is basically we'll deal with this as environmental safeguards subsequently yeah so all the concerns that i'm raising right now you don't need to worry about because there is post approval regulation that will that will help us manage air pollution uh, that will help us manage waste disposal that will help us ensure that the transportation problems from one place to the other are not uh, dealt with that will ensure that all the trees that you might fell will be able to uh, we, you know we'll be able to either pick it up and transplant somewhere some other places or we'll be able to compensate for it so there are techno fixes and solutions that have been proposed for all of the problems that i'm talking about but evidence has shown for the last 25 years of environment regulation in being placed that actually none of these have worked there are serious uh, and we can we can go on about it but the non compliance is upward of 90% and uh, and now at this this point of time uh, people are not even willing to buy in uh, buy some of those arguments now i'll run uh, just share my screen a little bit and uh, i have about So this is, you know, the the I'll just quickly go through because this uh, another five minutes or so, and uh, basically tell you about this one one particular project of uh, seven redevelopment colonies in 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 Delhi, which uh, were pooled in to create the the land area was pooled in to create, uh, you know, a World Trade Center in in the heart of Delhi, which is this this uh, this point of Nauroji Nagar. a world trade center the heart of new new delhi and this is all very prime real estate so for the purposes of actually maximizing land use for the world trade center the land you the land area was all pooled in yeah but for 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 us to be able to understand the environmental impact of these these projects these seven redevelopment projects they were split up into seven projects so we one doesn't really you know these the kind of spread out plots if you could see the environmental impact of about 10 km radius all across it 
it will be much larger than if you see it plot by plot. So in the environment regulation, the way it's being implemented is actually talking about these things plot by plot. So these are the colonies I'm talking about. These are lived environments. People have actually planted trees. There are much better pictures that people have had. But this is where right now uh, the houses are being demolished. But because there is resistance, all the trees are standing uh, very clearly. Uh, a similar colony was actually built. It's called the East Kidwai Nagar colony. It's already up and it's full of litigation right now. And just behind, of course, you see beautiful peacocks and flowers on the building. Uh, which has been erased otherwise. And just behind that is, is this, uh, you know, the, the slum uh, colony that you see. And uh, adjoining a, a very important stormwater drain, which was uh, at one point of time a birding haven. The same uh, principle of environment regulation and uh, uh, development planning and urban development planning is being applied to what what is currently an extremely controversial central vista redevelopment that we're talking about. For the purposes of uh, announcement, this the central vista redevelopment is, uh, you know, uh, from one point to uh, the other point, one composite uh, whole where it's got new, going to have the new parliament, the common central secretariat, several other, you know, uh, developments that are going to take place in this entire, uh, you know, uh, very important uh, precinct, heritage precinct of, uh, in, in Delhi. But for the purposes of land use change and environment regulation, it's been broken up and taken up plot by plot, building by building. So, you know, the questions of cumulative assessments, impact assessments, of uh, cumulative loss of public space, all of that uh, in this uh, evolving project are really big questions currently being uh, contested heavily in the Supreme Court. Now I'll move away from urban areas to just end quickly and move to some of the mining and you know other geographies that we're talking about and the imaginations that we take to some of these places. This is in many ways a recreational space created in a coal mining hub of Chhattisgarh, where you know the, the idea is to create Mauritius there, you know, because everything else is black and dense and etc. But you'll have this one spot where people can go and enjoy a small mountain top and, and it will be open to only the, the you know, uh, uh, officials who are in, engaged in mining. It's not really fully public access. It's got a picnic spot, all those kind of things. Who can go there? Uh, regulation has determined this very clearly. And uh, just to end with some of these visuals about these areas that, you know, people are, you, you can actually visually kind of imagine, almost imagine some of, you know, how regulation law and policies are allowing um, bit by bit dangers to enter some of these spaces. You know, you're like, uh, people, are, people are having to live with a, a, a constant fear of when does that coal mine actually come uh, towards me. And finally, it's also about the point about uh, compliance and non-compliance that I was talking about, that this mine is operating with the condition that it's going to be a zero, uh, zero discharge mine. Yeah? And this is a lived space that the mine has come, come to, and this mineral is important for many other kinds of uh, uh, development across the, uh, you know, across the country, moving away from this, uh, this uh, otherwise underdeveloped area. But you can see that the discharge is actually destroyed a whole large tract of farmland. And this is all rice cultivation uh, in, in the state of Orissa. So I, you know, with, I just leave us with some of these thoughts and images and I'll be happy to uh, you know, discuss some of these uh, things as, as well. In terms of, uh, you know, how we create and recreate spaces and, uh, you know, and inter intervene in these ecologies and how, how regulation actually abets it has, a, has significant power over how we can shape futures. And these futures are for people, uh, futures for the economy, and futures uh, of, uh, you know, in many ways, what we imagine the environment to be, you know, Mauritius in Chhattisgarh or something else. And I'll just end that. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kanji. Uh, Amrita, can we move? move on with your presentation.
Amrita, you're mute. You need to unmute yours. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be at the Fair Table. It's virtually. Uh, so for my talk today uh, on society and culture, I thought I would focus on, on a subject that is, um, you know, a kind of very dominant force in our lives and right now extremely controversial, which is the media, especially the news media. Um, so, you know, recently for a few years, I was, I'm no longer at uh, the Indian Institute of Science, but I was there for the last 10 years. And uh, I used to teach a, a short course on the journalism. And I used to kind of start by asking students uh, what they thought journalism should be. What was, uh, was the media, sorry, I, I'm, I'm kind of, okay. yeah. We What's can hear you very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't. I can't see myself. It's okay. Um. Yeah. So, so they would always give me this answer that you know, journalism was meant to protect the weak uh, against the state. It was meant to investigate wrongdoing, uh, or it was meant to uh, uh, kind of speak truth to power. So all these various various ideas, which really derive from a very kind of um, long um, history of kind of ideas of what the media should be, the, the press as it was called, uh, particularly from Edmund Burke's famous, very famous kind of articulation of uh, the press being the fourth state, uh, which basically meant that it was an independent authority and had power to, uh, to speak to, you know, to curb the kind of excesses of uh, other centers of power. Now, the thing is that I, there is now, I mean, if you look around, I don't think anyone would feel that the media is performing these functions. Uh, right now, I think there's a level of kind of no credibility of the media and uh, a sort of lack of um, almost an anger for the kind of shifted, uh, uh, trivialized priorities, uh, the kind of lack of in-depth, serious uh, reporting, uh, so on and so forth. There's fake news, there's sort of investigations that have revealed paid news. So how did this gap come about? Uh, and I want to just sort of brief, briefly kind of present why this gap came about uh, between the ideas and reality. And um, because I think that that is probably this, this these processes have affected various other areas as well. It's the world we live in. And then briefly, I want to touch upon the future. Uh, so the two key factors, I'm going to kind of enable uh, screen sharing. Okay, um, yeah, I, I, this is just a little clip from, I think, um, the kind of sensationalism, et cetera, that we see on news media today. Uh, so the two, two key factors to kind of, uh, that are responsible for, uh, within which we can kind of locate this, uh, this phenomenon is basically two, two things. One is, of course, the technological revolution uh, which grew the media, it made it global and pervasive. Uh, you know, electro electronic media, VCRs, cable TV, satellite television, um, the whole kind of gamut of uh, internet phones, streaming, etc. Uh, and the second is the sort of dominance of uh, neoliberalism. Uh, with its emphasis on profit maximization and the centrality of the market, uh, you know, starting from the 80s with Thatcher and Reagan, and shaping economic policies across the world, uh, including, of course, post liberalization India. Now, the figure that straddled both these, uh, you know, technology and uh, neoliberalism was uh, this figure, Rupert Murdoch. Now, I, I don't know, you know, in the 1980s and well, up to up to the 2000s till he kind of fell from grace uh, very recently. He was, um, I mean, he is, he was very well known. I mean, perhaps now 
for younger people, he is not that well known. But he is really the key figure that has sort of shifted and changed uh, changed the way uh, we see journalism today. Now, just a short introduction to Rupert Murdoch was that he was a son of an Australian newspaper magnate who uh, around 1969 onwards started extending across the world and came to own hundreds of local, national and international publishing outlets, including the Times, the, the UK Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, uh, HarperCollins, the book publisher, Sky News, Fox News, 21st Century Fox, Star TV, of course, very importantly for us in Asia. Um, so now, all these things, I mean, in a way, you can also see in Rupert Murdoch the kind of uh, trends that were dominating global media. So one was that you had this increasing size of the media and its increasing reach across the world and its interconnectedness. But at the same time, you had control resting in fewer and fewer people. So if, if one person like Murdoch, who actually was financing all these purchases of uh, media outlets by just going to the banks and then you know uh, taking a loan each time to buy each new property and then hypothecating it and taking the next one. So if one person like that can have such power, you can, you know, you can kind of understand that the promise of diversity was in a sense sort of uh, nullified uh, by this process. Um, but the reason I bring Rupert Murdoch up here right now is uh, to kind of uh, explain how he introduced, you can say, at least for the industry, but it's perhaps not that well known outside it, almost a new sort of dictum to replace Burke's famous dictum of the media being the fourth estate. Uh, for him, what Murdoch kept saying was that the news is just another business. And this became extremely influential across the world. And certainly in India, you had uh, the Times of India, for instance, which is like uh, such an old and venerated um, media house, uh, picking up that line. Uh, and then you had it spreading across the media till everyone was kind of following the line. But I want to kind of talk a little bit about, I want to analyze this statement. The news is just another business. What exactly does it mean? So first of all, and I will contend that this is a lie. And why am I saying that? So first of all, if the news media still is sort of um, surrounded by these ideals of um, you know being playing the role of the fourth estate and curbing excessive powers of other power centers then it has a responsibility now which other business has responsibility of that sort you know kind of public role to play the other thing is when you say just another business for murdoch it meant profit maximization but is that really how even regular businesses run I mean, can a car manufacturer make a car without brakes, or can a um, you know can can a, a pen maker make a pen without which doesn't write uh, you know and say well I just didn't put ink because it would make more profit for me. And what Murdoch was doing was he was putting topless models uh, photographs in his newspapers. He was uh, his staff was in a paper called News of the World was taping private conversations between people and then printing them. Uh, these, to my mind, are criminal activities, and they cannot be justified in the name of selling. Uh, so that's the, the second point. The, the third point is that when Murdoch said it was, uh, the news media is just another business, what he was eliding uh, was the fact, uh, you know, he's completely kind of ignoring the fact that it had so much power. Again, which business has so much power? Uh, and he was using it very freely to intimidate politicians, to get favorable policies. I mean, he was using his power extremely uh, effectively. And so this just another business uh, was, at, you know, any way you look at it, it was a lie. Um, but the problem is that, as I said, it, it spread across the world and it's certainly in India, that's what we are seeing today. We are seeing two things. We are seeing, uh, on the one hand, the Murdochization of, uh, of the media. And on the other hand, we're seeing a, a kind of an explosion in size. So just to give you some figures, um, I mean, uh, today it's a kind of US dollar 20 to 25 billion industry. There's 900 television channels, uh, 82,000 registered publications, including 14,000 newspapers, 500 million internet users, 
250 million Facebook users, 67 million Instagram and 30 million Twitter uh, users, 10 million US dollars in advertising. Uh, so, so you can kind of see these two things come together, as I said, the kind of idea that uh, you can do anything for profit um, and, uh, and the fact that you have this huge and immense profit. Well, at least you have this, a lot of money coming in. Now, whether you are profitable or not depends, of course, on how you kind of uh, function. Um, so now this juggernaut is controlling every aspect of our lives. And apparently there seems to be no way to control it. No, no kind of uh, entry point for the reader, or the viewer, uh, or the citizen to, to kind of enter and uh, you know, grab some, some sort of reins for it. Um, so there are certain, there are concerns, and I just want to kind of give a kind of broad picture of what, 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 uh, what these concerns are. So first of all, there is this, um, this development that everybody is a producer, right? Everybody is a producer of news. Uh, anyone can, um, can put a WhatsApp message out and circulate it. Anyone can, um, you know, sort of, uh, put out a tweet, um, and, and we have seen not just not just sort of uh, an ordinary person, but you have seen media houses, uh, Z Television actually doctoring clips and then putting them out, uh, resulting in arrests of people. Uh, we saw some time ago, uh, a few years ago, this uh, this school teacher, uh, a principal in Delhi, a school principal in Delhi, being beaten up by parents because uh, a business rival of hers uh, or her husband's put out some fake news about um, the fact, I mean, saying that she was running a prostitution thing. So anyone can, it seems as if right now, anyone can do anything. So there is that, that danger. The other danger is, of course, manipulation, uh, whether it's by advertisers or by ideologically driven forces, which could be anyone and anything. It could be someone, uh, you know, wanting to kind of uh, change the way people eat. It could be someone, it could be a jihadi force. It could be uh, someone who doesn't want people to take vaccines. It could be any anyone and anything. Uh, recently, if um, you might have seen this, this film going around about uh, the idea that COVID scare was being created by people who wanted to um, you know sell cheap vaccines or, or make a lot of money and things like that so a lot of this stuff is floating around and there is kind of it's very hard to uh, tell what uh, you know what is right and what is wrong um, then there is manipulation by politicians uh, now again if you've been following the news of uh, this firm called Cambridge Analytica um, there have been uh, there was a sort of expose and a film has been made about it as well where they were actually getting into people's Facebook accounts, stealing data, and using it. Um, people who are uh, waging the pro-Brexit campaign, uh, people who are uh, supporting Trump, I mean, they were actually using this data uh, to, to plant certain stories, to plant, you know, to kind of put in the right messages, uh, do a certain kind of messaging uh, strategy that would uh, affect a certain sort of the results the way they wanted. Uh, so, um, and then, of course, there have been repeated allegations of uh, Russians uh, intervening in the American elections and so on. So this is a real concern going forward. And this is a new concern because we've always had a certain amount of um, you know, problematic, uh, like booth capturing. And these are all, uh, but, it, it, you know, these kind of uh, problems of election um, results or how elections are uh, conducted are, are small scale. I mean, they've, they've been, let's say, a kind of small part of it, but the potential for this sort of manipulation is immense. And we don't even know what, what, you know, what forms it can take. Uh, so, um, and I mean, it doesn't have to be elections also, you know, it can even be that pre-elections, right? You can collect a crowd uh, on the basis of a rumor, you can have a lynching mob uh, ready, or you can do all kinds of things, it seems, uh, right? So, and we have no safeguards. For that so what uh, what can we do uh, so so far you know I've been sounding kind of very bleak and this is really the bleak picture that uh, exists today but in truth I I think that there is a, a lot to be excited about in the kind of potential of technology and the possibility it offers um, because the reach the forms potentially new financial models all these 
uh, there is potential for all that. Uh, but the question is, how do we, how do we even start? Uh, you know, how do we even get to that? Given how how um, gloomy the picture sounds right now. So I would say, first of all, one has to be aware. One has to understand how we got here. Uh, one has to understand uh, the history of the media and post-liberalization in India, for instance, the kind of things that have, have led to us being here. Uh, we have to understand how news is and information is created and distributed. And we have to strengthen ourselves against manipulation one, one by understanding how it functions. But the second thing I think is to be engaged with the media and not as a consumer, but as an innovator. And um, here I think, you know, the, the fact that everyone is a producer of news, let's say you flip it and, and instead of seeing it as a bad thing, see it as a great thing. Um, it can, for instance, to give you an example of, of, uh, of that. So the, uh, at an earlier time, if you're stuck in traffic, then you could get some kind of idea of how to <clears throat> how to go from one a to point A to point B. But if you can have kind of crowd crowdsourcing of people calling in um, who are stuck in various places and actually giving you information, that's kind of a, a, a small little thing that people were using. You know? The second thing is citizen citizen journalism, which you know, which means that people um, who can see something happening in front of them. Uh, you kind of spread it out. I mean, even when 9-11 happened, for instance, photographs came from tourists uh, who happened to be on the spot. So, so there is that. But I'm thinking of innovation on a much larger scale. Innovation not, not just at that level, which is useful, but um, because, you know, we, we are kind of, um, if we are already news producers, then we can perhaps even think of models of how the media should be. So, you know, to come back to, to this course I was teaching at IISC, and my students were, you know, all around 19 or 20 year old science, budding scientists uh, and engineers. And they, to be honest, didn't like to take my course because they thought that it wasn't contributing their, to their overall score. And they kept, you know, they went openly said, we're not getting enough marks and this is taking away time from our labs. And I said, you know, you, you can't not engage with the media. It's a huge force. And if you don't engage with it, uh, it will end up controlling you. So if you don't want it to control you, you have to engage with it. That's one. You have to understand it. You have to understand how it works. But the other thing is, I don't think you can solve the media's problems internally. Um, it, it, it's too, the, the problems are too big and they're too connected with society. Um, they're too connected with larger issues of economic policy. They're connected with the mood of nations and, and you know human beings with technology uh, and with corporate power. It, they're connected with too many things. So I said, you know, um, if if scientists, if you as scientists listen to me talking about the problems of the media, then you might find a solution from science. I mean, talking together, we might kind of come to a solution that's completely new. And it might be something completely different. I mean, it, it might not be the media as is. Maybe something completely and different, will, uh, new will evolve. Uh, so to give you an example, because I spent time on a science institute, I kind of started understanding the world slightly differently in the sense that you come from a, you come from a culture where politics is all important. So if you take a newspaper, then politics is all important. And then everything comes below that. Um, but if you if you're on a science institute and you're watching uh, you know ant species or um, you're looking at a new kind of um, metal uh, sort of something some fabrication that that has been done or a new product that's the news and so you learn to kind of uh, reorient yourself and I I think you know that's why talking talking here today I think it's it's always wonderful because. Now, as architects, there might be ways you have of, of looking at the media uh, structurally um, that, that could lead to a kind of completely new form evolving. Uh, it could be in any matter, you know, it could be how do we maybe finance the news business? How, how do we consume it? Um, I don't know, what are its priorities or how? So, so I, I really think that there is great potential, but um, it does mean jumping over this really bad tough hurdle right now. So thank you. I'm going to stop here and look forward to your questions.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. And uh, let me now take this uh, opportunity to really thank uh, all the three speakers. I didn't want to spend much time in between the in between the presentations, but uh, all three presentations uh, in my reading have taken some very pertinent case studies from the present, but opened up a range of important questions which one could see as paradigm questions or which one could see as in, in, the, in the framework or the language of the studio manifesto uh, kind, of, uh, kind of questions. And I think uh, this is going to be a great opportunity for us to take forward in the, in the discussion session that we, uh, that we have. But before I, I, I uh, come in with more comments, uh, just to add one one sample to uh, Amrita's uh, many examples and and things that she shared with us, but also this sample, uh, I, I I thought of it also connects all the three presentations in the way the presentations were thinking aloud, through the through the through their areas of work and through their areas of experience. There's a meme, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, there's the you know the Instagram reels. So there's a, there's a reel which I saw which says that if my grandchild is, is going to study 2020 in history, he's going to study pandemic, lockdown, cyclones, hurricane, all of this. And what was my father doing? <laughs> making a reel, <laughs> making a TikTok video. But that, that I think in a sense, it is, it's, it's fun, but I think it's, it's very telling also uh, also of something that uh, that all the three speakers have i think uh, brought to a to a certain forefront and uh, which is i think the the levels at which we ask uh, questions and i think i'm slowly going to make this conversation more specific to architecture and the architecture the masters architecture students that we that we have here here with us i think uh, in Beginning with Luciano's, uh, Luciano's presentation, I was immediately, uh, immediately forced uh, to think, and it got reinforced with Kanchi's, uh, Kanchi's uh, again, uh, presentation. I was forced to think that does, in fact, the architect write, need to write a manifesto? What am I going to do tomorrow? What is the space of operation and action for an, for an architect? And which I, which I mean in a in a space of this, I mean, the, the question has to be asked in a space that, what is the job profile of an architect? And this, I would like to sort of put it in the, in the framework, uh, a conversation that I've had many times with somebody like Prem Chandavarkar or, or Rahul Merotra is, is the, the, the area of concern, the area of, uh, of concern where, where different kinds of interventions are very, very important. And then there are your areas of influence and action or action and influence, where as an architect, you're able to do certain things and there are scopes and limitations within your, within your professional, professional space. At one level, I think Luciano precisely opens up, uh, opens up that by taking the question of, uh, question of labor and saying, how does, the, how does the architect ask the question about, about labor? Is it, is it simply about the, is it simply about the question of who can do what kind of a job? A certain, a certain lineage of questions which comes to us from craft and artisan kind of debates or that shifts into technology, technology debates where it only becomes as if it's a, it's a linear, it's some kind of a teleological development, it's some kind of a sequential development in, in technology. But, but, but when you open up the question of, uh, question of labor, where, where he opens it up through a series of examples of, uh, of buildings and, and where it is, where the question is also much beyond the broader scope of many things or many, many, as he said, skill and intellectual histories that, that labor uh, or working forces, all forms of working forces bring with them to, bring with them together. I think the question of labor becomes much more uh, in the context of architecture, in the context of building, simply then about this relationship of an object has been thought through and now it has to be produced. And that question does not, you cannot divide that question into that binary binary any longer. He, he sort of provocatively ends uh, with the Zaha Hadid uh, incident, uh, which, is, which is a very important question. Could the architect have said that? 
Uh, did the was the architect? In fact, I think this was a question that came up in class just the last uh, week. I think I used this reference in one of the one of the classes. Can the architect say that? Was the architect uh, 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 being an architect and saying that this is my scope of profession and I can't do anything beyond that? Should the architect think as a person who is part of a larger social social structure and has responsibilities through the profession towards towards many many things? And sometimes it translates into an architect like Brinda Somaya talking about how she sort of understands gender roles playing out on a construction construction site. But there are there are uh, there are much larger questions that come into labor. How does architectural construction sometimes play on the political instability in particular regions of the of the world? For example, when when I was visiting Abu Dhabi over a year, year and a half for a project again and again, one wouldn't fail to notice the amount of labor that was sort of literally herded at airports, which came from the from the instable, uh, politically instable regions of Iran, Iraq, and the surrounding surrounding Saudi Arabia, et cetera, including from places like Rajasthan, uh, Gujarat. So right from Pakistan to Iran, Iraq, you have this region that is producing a certain kind of a labor, which is in many ways getting employed, even in the most conformist kind of a typology, which is the Sheikh Zayed, Sheikh Zayed Mosque. Uh, which is which is using labor, which also comes from a certain history of working with marble, comes from a certain history of working in the Mughal building traditions over over the last sort of five generations, uh, five generations, etc. So, so in that sense, there are there are particulars to this to this labor question, but I think it it essentially asks us to expand the question to the field of architecture. What is the architect going to do? Where is the architect going to? define a certain form of a uh, certain form of action and I, I think this this in many ways comes forth uh, comes forth beautifully uh, when Kanchi speaks uh, speaks talking and she opens up uh, environment in this question of terms and uses I, I, I love that love those set of propositions which were sort of seen as a set of terms that you approach a so-called problem or an issue with but what are the forms of what are the forms of uses what are the forms of regulations? And, and those are essentially imagining forms of crisis. So, but, but in a sense, she did, not, she did not talk about environment as a crisis, but she actually spoke about environment as a certain kind of a wider state of living, living and, and being. And the crisis of environment, uh, it, it, I really, at, at least I saw it like this, that the crisis of environment are actually the larger crisis of states of being in many ways. The most important thing that I think affects many of us and I think it's soon coming out in a form of a book also, the shifting grounds between the, the classical divide of urban and rural. And what is what are these sort of, so the urban sort of uh, dissipating into the rural, the rural taking different kinds of levels of urbanity and rurality mixed with, mixed with each other. What are the different grounds it is going to produce for us? What are, the, what are going to be then the challenges? If you, whether you have to do a small house in a in a place like that, or you have to set up a larger sort of a sort of a factory or a building in in these kind of changing environmental contexts, it's not the issue of environment, but it becomes the issue of how we address the state of living in this world, living in this world world today. And if you then overlap this with the question of labor, you obviously see us see a certain kind of a ground emerging, which is sort of constantly taking the ground from below the architect's feet, quite. Quite sort of, uh, quite sort of soon, because in many ways the models with which architects have functioned, the models that shape themselves, obviously they've never been constant models, but the models that have shaped through the 20th century and even in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, those models clearly are are not functional or are not going to be functional. Uh, functional anymore? Does the architect then become incapacitated? Does the architect feel crippled, or does the architect, like the scientist on the on the campus, uh, 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 sort of begin to withdraw uh, from the sphere of influence and from the sphere of and becomes much more sort of safer within a cocoon? I think this is also one of the questions uh, that we raised in the in the state of architecture exhibition bias becoming more and more lifestyle producers rather than leaders or rather than being sort of producers in the larger uh, larger sphere of the culture larger sphere of, of of the of the social and cultural 
uh, places of places of production. So in that sense, the architect from playing that larger role is sort of withdrawing uh, from the from the sphere because he is he or she is probably finding this ground more and more difficult to negotiate with the existing set of tools and ideas about architecture. So in a sense, this, this really sort of opens up that what are the tools of engagement, what are the tools of practice, and what are the tools of action that the architect will essentially need to, need to seriously rejuggle in his or her mind and through various other forms, various other forms of the collective. And in, and in that sense, I think to, to bring out the practice of media, to bring out the practice of, uh, practice of journalism, where I think you, in, in, in the reference to your students' responses, you brought out, without using the word, but a certain sense of the conscience. How do you, how do you build or how do you maintain a certain kind of a conscience within our, within our social, social structures? We, we ultimately believe that we are a modern society. We ultimately believe that we that we live within certain relationships, modern democratic democratic politics, uh, that we are certain kind of a system of, of civility. We believe that there is a certain kind of a fraternity. We believe, and we would want to continue to believe in some of these some of these areas where we imagine the classics of fraternity, liberty, equality to sort of continue within these social within these sort of social frameworks and 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 all our practices would sort of in a broader sense contribute to this but clearly some practices are are unable and 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 probably architecture is one such practice which is unable to function within this system any any longer with ideas and ideas and tools so then to sort of take from the, from the about media, news, etc., that from a broader understanding of everyday life, as a practice of conscience, as a practice of 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 the fact that you you maintain equilibrium by contestations, you don't maintain equilibrium by the imagination of a certain kind of a peace, because because even in the Buddhist imagination, peace is a is a, is a constantly evolving process. It's not the it's not the shanta that we that we that we very easily transpose on that on that idea but it's a constant process of maintaining peace it is not sort of achieved enlightenment is a process of achievement it is not a process that you get at one point in one point in one in time so from that to sort of move to various forms of action amruta amruta says that um, says that how do you sort of how do you sort of see the possibilities to turn and uh, and 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 you give a few examples of what could be innovation in this kind of a this kind of a scenario. But basically, what what you are also asking is how can one sort of turn these uh, turn these positions, turn these existences, to to rethink and and reformulate practices in that uh, in that in that sense. And I think one of the one of the key things uh, uh, besides if I if 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 I can sort of take the Luciano reference besides one of the key things of labor. Uh, the other thing that the that the architecture and planning practice in some ways has lost is also the notion of the of the geometric uh, physical space in that in that sense and the production of various other kinds of other kinds of spaces which i am also myself uh, as a person who works with the city sometimes resistant totally to engage with with sort of the other forms of spaces that are that are being created but i think that's the other arena that that the profession of architecture and planning will will essentially be, have to address because all the projects that we are, see, we are seeing are either in a moment of large crisis like the central vista for example because they have a very different or they or they plant a very different conception of classical space but using very very different technologies of negotiation so they are they are they are negotiating a certain kind of a politics through the classical tools of, of planning. So classical tools are being sort of converted uh, for very modern, for very contemporary sort of manipulation of, of, of politics. And, and where is the resistance coming from? The resistance is, is coming from the classic civil spaces of, of different formats. So whether it is somebody like News Laundry who can, who can operate via, via Instagram and 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 uh, and and that form of uh, that form of constantly questioning, constantly sort of disseminating. To to take Amrita's uh, construction as one example, uh, one example, one example of that, or the or the other forms like like what will become the academic space? 
how how will sort of the academic space uh, look at itself between the spaces of the science and the spaces of broader questions of of thinking within cultures and societies that we that we live so from from that science uh, science institute and and somehow i'm also a little familiar with the science institute you're referencing so so one one has a one has a familiarity but you know architecture campuses have functioned not very differently uh, from i i from i i s c and with all due respect to to i i s c and some of the some of the fantastic scholars but uh, but but uh, architecture campuses have not very differently operated in that in that sense of a certain kind of a of a scientific vigor and the question about the humanities becomes a certain kind of a generosity of the campus as if to bring in the questions of the questions of the humanity and i think that is something uh, something else that education spaces in architecture will have to address stronger and stronger also with the numbers that we are that we are dealing with uh, dealing with uh, dealing with today so so thank you for these three presentations and it helped me uh, uh, put some of my own observations and thoughts in in context and bring them back to your uh, your presentations and i hope i have not misread any part of of the three presentations that 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 were very succinct i think and the way they scaled from the questions that are that are large and that are extremely important to coming to certain how the specifics and i think this is something very important for especially the master students how the specifics enable us sometimes to think of these kind of large field shifting field shifting uh, 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 questions so uh, uh, are there any responses from surya mehul tridip to sort of add on to to my set of responses and i think and the speakers would like to connect to what you kind of are trying to make yeah sure so i, I was just wondering if if any one of you all wanted to add a few observations and and then we could would move would you like to respond then Hi, Ron. Thank you, um, Pradeep. Here, um, I think fundamental. I think all three um, um, have been fundamental. But let's 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 uh, spend a few minutes thinking about the implications of what they've said. For us, as as a campus, as a university, but also uh, as as people who engage with this profession, what you said was said about labor. and he sp spoke in terms of only the skill of the labor uh, in the indian context all of us know that the construction labor is the most exploited labor possible there is no other sector of our industry where the conditions of work are so inhuman uh, and what is our response to that has there been a response to it i don't think that either as practicing professionals or as institutions we have ever looked at it uh, their abilities and skills are something else but the fact is that this is a, you know there is this idea of a recyclable labor through which the construction industry in india has worked it was it became very evident to some of us this time uh when the lockdown happened and millions of people started walking back home large number of these were part of the construction industry an industry that we are willingly well more willingly than otherwise part of uh, and, and and so the question of labor is not only of skill but it's it's not only of livelihood but it's about certain rights of labor the conditions under which they function and the responsibility that we as designers and architects or people part of that profession have towards the conditions of labor uh most of us most of us uh, and i'm sorry to say this this includes our campus as well we don't pay any attention to the labor colony which comes up on the on the construction site um rarely do we do that uh and 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 that's that's part of the economy of construction uh also let's understand also let's understand the predicament that without that cheap labor the nature of the cost 
of construction in India would be at a very different level. And so we think that this is a kind of a happy equilibrium or unhappy equilibrium that we are part of. And that's something I think Luciano's uh, talk ought to make us think not only about the skill sets, the materiality of it, but also the condition of labor itself. And that's something that we need to think about. Kanji spoke of something very beautiful. Is this, but beautiful in the sense she spoke beautifully about it, about this want that the designers have of flattening things out, of, of, of creating, uh, creating uh, spaces which are open uh, and starting de novo. One problem, one problem that I've always felt since 1993, uh, to give us a design problem, uh, was to actually not allow students. And this really begins with the training that we give. Because we, we start designing on a blank sheet of paper, a pristine white sheet of paper that we take. Uh, it's uncluttered, there's not a mark on it. And the only mark that we make is the mark that I make as a designer. And therefore the assumption is that the same conditions must, must prevail, must obtain, in the world in which that building or that plan is to come up. Uh, Surya and Mehul, the challenge for us is, can we actually start designing on a cluttered sheet of paper? Which is what a land parcel looks like, uh, uh, right? Uh, uh, and we don't do that. And I think these are mental frames that we imbibe. Uh, every time we make an error, we, we change a sheet uh, and a new pristine sheet comes. Uh, we don't have a record of all the errors that we make in the design process. And I think these are important mental exercises. So Kanchi, uh, you know, uh, uh, one reason uh, why, we, why we flatten things out is because that's, that's the sheet that we draw on. Uh, not I, but but everybody around me, I only write, uh, uh, um, um, but, but, but that happens. Uh, you know, uh, also, you know, the idea that uh, the topography must appear flat. And so I will level the ground of all its contours be before I start designing. I think these are parts of the assumptions which are latent in the design thinking, design pedagogy, not only accept, across. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to, to, to be conscious of and see how we problematize it. Um, and Amrita, of course, the, the, uh, what she really meant, uh, what she wants us to know is that there is, there is a dharma, there is a duty of being a citizen. Right? And unless you eat, become aware of that dharma, of that duty, that obligation, please don't complain that the world is messed up. Um, it is messed up because we are messed up. I mean, it's like saying I was in a traffic jam. No, you are the bloody traffic, uh, right? I mean, we contribute to that jam and we forget that we think that we are not the problem. We are as much a problem uh, in the media landscape that we find ourselves in. We are as much a problem uh, in the apathy about the political sphere that she spoke about, the economics of media. Uh, we, we pay very little attention as professionals to the economics or the political economy of things. Unless we begin to pay attention to the political economy of things, of materials, of industries, of practices, of, of cultural artifacts, I don't think we're going to go very far uh, as 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 citizens, but also as practitioners. So that's what I wanted to say. And in, and in that sense, it does tie up with what, what happened yesterday, where we, we try to speak of the ethical universe. And, and the responsibility of the designer, is the, res, is the ethical responsibility only to the client? Or does the ethical responsibility, as, as uh, Luciano finally said, extend to the maker of the building, which is the labor? And, 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 and more such things. So thank you. Thank you very much to you. Um, a good thank afternoon. You. Yes. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much. I think much. it's very interesting because 
uh, what what really uh, because these varied speakers that we've been having and these thoughts that are connecting and i think the way what this does is this is fundamentally questioning at one level finally as architects as as a profession the agency for us to what agency had been given up in a large degree in the modernist era to to large degree the humanities have already emphasized on to us about how it is important we get back through participative processes through beginning to understand scale through beginning to understand skill labor i think what's important is for the profession itself through our i mean we make the profession just like what they just said that it's like the, we make the traffic we make the profession we as individual architects each one practicing out there and i think it's important how each one of us begins to view what agency we have and how and what all we can do with it when we frame our 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 way of looking at what we produce whether it is a mini school of a shelter uh, for a very low economic uh, 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 income versus a uh, lifestyle space but what is that agency that we have and i think more questions on this would be useful uh, if we kind of uh, uh, i think we have these wonderful speakers here if we could put these questions to how they see us you know right they seeing what they seeing from their view point how do they see us and i think that would be interesting to know i that's the, that's how i'd like to like how would how would kanchi see our profession she has already explained to us uh, about our ability to flatten wonderfully i mean uh, amrita it would be nice to know uh, you been i mean and i think it's very interesting that you were act, i mean now that you, it struck me when you were speaking that you were actually in the hub of uh, of signs of of the prima donna of you know in indian uh, ecosphere in science and you're a, you were a, uh, a a a media person out there and i can imagine uh, so it would be interesting to for us to know uh, how you can help us uh, uh, work our ways around because we i mean the only projects we all see in media are the projects uh, like the bilbao let's say and uh, and for and for all that at what lisiana said bilbao may have innovated some processes in construction but all of those are of a certain scale that that like that may even never ever get to the large uh, you know the large numbers in in these global south so so i think we'll have to look at technology we'll have to look at media we will have to look at law and and figure a way around so i'll open it to yeah mehul if you want to add so something yeah just wait till up uh, uh, you know amrita writes the underbelly of indian institute of sciences it's coming it's coming and i'm uh, waiting for it <laughs> <laughs> but i was just saying that what iisc is, bangalore is sept amdavad is in a in a yeah, sense I'm, of being premier I'm, institutions in their in sure. their professional and intellectual spheres and and in so, that sense i think sept uh, for all of us uh, uh, as i will do campus. i will write the <laughs> underbelly <laughs> no we got to invite amrita for this <laughs> but i'm saying the the question scale up very differently obviously we are dealing with 500 institutions or of of architecture education and i think the question spreads out in different places in 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 different ways but i think uh, institutions like whether it's sept whether it's spa or even uh locally important institutions like what kamla raja has had a certain kind of a history all these schools have a certain role and responsibility in sort of uh, uh putting this questions on the ground uh, on the ground together and and the and the clearing of the ground just a little uh, thing in fact kumara swami in his book on the construction of uh, ancient indian cities talks about the the various vastu texts talking about how you clear the blemishes on the ground before you start work so you never start on a ground which has ups and downs and many blemishes they have to be cleaned so that uh good spirits can come and reside and and make all of us happy human beings but but maybe yeah uh, uh, kwanchi to to take uh, uh, thridip and surya's question as to what is the reflection on the profession of of uh, architecture architects and 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 planners what is the what is the imagination 
of us in the in the rest of the world kind of a kind of a thing i'm putting that whole burden on you but if you could have some reflective thoughts to begin with on on that uh so i mean i um just been uh, ever since that question was raised i've been just thinking about it in terms of uh, all i want to say is don't retreat you know like that question mm. that came up was that uh, everything around us might seem too difficult to tackle you know there's an environment is nice and take care of when you're constructing a building you have to take care of energy efficiency and uh, you know the tree that is uh, right at the plot to uh, you know the where the construction material will come from where it will go uh, to some uh, you know crazy greenies screaming and shouting that this building should never come up here all those kind of things but i i think the way i see an approach uh, the role of the architect i think it's 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 grown and it's important as more important than ever before because actually what we are doing is uh, when i was talking about redevelopment no uh, like you're actually redeveloping at, at a very different scale and i think almost mm. all uh, existing dense urban areas or the expanding urban footprint expanding yeah. is actually uh, is the domain of the architect and i think there is that's where understanding of uh, resource politics environment uh, understanding of how regulation can actually help in take certain good decisions uh, uh, you know which could be which could bring together uh, sound arch- arch- architectural practice as well as uh, you know basically don't go back to that point and arg- and, and don't support the argument saying that the construction sector is not polluting at all i mean hmm. you would it, it's bizarre that you know that you have to push through that argument to say listen touch touch me or not so i think i see it as uh, i mean the responsibility has only grown and i think it's it's a uh, there's a huge opportunity for partnership and i think that's and i can see that happening a lot in different cities i think uh, people from planning and uh, architectural fraternity who are uh, uh, friends now have raised some very substantial concerns whether it's on the mumbai coastal road or uh, you know or for that matter the kind of redevelopment in central vista redevelopment in delhi uh, many other cities i think these are important questions from your from what is required from the immediate job at hand to what is happening to cities and urban areas or you know these urban rural uh, convergent spaces as a whole so uh, i think my only my only thought is actually on the contrary of retreating is you have to embed yourself in the resource politics of the times uh, to be able to uh, build good lived spaces so so kanchi what you're saying is very important but there is a little bit of a twist to that and maybe that i will connect uh, with the question to luciano because very often what what you're framing uh, uh, very sort of provocatively as resource politics is very often taken as resource crisis that can be technocratically solved so you know you will spend years trying to design a chair that is going to save electricity and god knows how much electricity you burn in trying to trying to do that research in that uh, in that sense so it becomes like sort of a uh, painting over over so questions which have been then reduced to and and there is no fun in that technological exploration as well uh, in a sense because technological exp- uh, uh, exploration is going to connect as much with questions of labor both in levels of skill or even in the levels that tridip was framing for example uh, uh, innovations in the hall of nations wouldn't have been possible if india could not afford the labor it can afford for a particular kind of a construction uh, construction technology and there are many such examples like what germany can do india cannot do but at the same time what india can do germany cannot do because certain products in germany would become exorbitantly expensive because they are labor intensive but india can do india can do can do them and and not at the cost of exploitation but at at other levels but rather than seeing this as resource very often the architects uh, and this we face even in the even in things like the phd uh, phd program that it is it becomes a more solution orientation so it is like a crisis which has to be given some kind of a booster dose of science or or technological exploration and hence the problem will be problem will be solved the whole rating of buildings and projects works like that and and you sort of pointed out the political problems of of these kind of uh, systems of assessment that that governments take 
at the government level with all the sort of technocratic uh, uh, framework, but 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 there, but there is an underlying politics to the to the whole thing. So so Luciano, if if this debate you could sort of expand a little bit a uh, little bit further in in the way you have been looking at uh, looking at labor, which has I think given us a very good uh, point from within the uh, field of making a building to the larger sort of uh, questions of the ways of being and living in the world in a in a certain way. Um, I, yeah, I think the I mean the the point my point I'm, I'm a building engineer, so my uh, view of um, the architectural profession and uh, it's it's um, I've always be very tempted to study architecture because uh, the, the 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 reason I mean the the ability of controlling so many variables um, it's always fascinated me but what I feel and my, my my approach to this research and to this talk is pretty much the same, but what I feel is like in the last probably 20 years, um, this, um, the architectural profession lost a little bit of a, um, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but it's, uh, a, Mm, the architects are, are considered in, in, in Europe and in the UK, my experience is based in the UK, in Italy and in Australia, architects are the ones that need to decide the, the pretty things. So the, the, there is a, a gradual, um, uh, the, the importance of the, of the architects gradually lost the grip on, uh, on the reality and, and society. Where what I instead think is that the future of the, the of the profession is to realize that design can solve issues. Mm. So the it's it, I think the core of, I I teach in a school of architecture. I've been teaching all my life in school of architecture, and 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 the statement I always communicate to my students like design and it's not about the color. It's not about the material of, of a facade. It's solving issues. And I'm very grateful for this new debate about climate change that is taking uh, a big uh, chunk of, uh, of the conversation. Because then finally, architects are seeing like the ones that be able to orchestrate, as I said, so many variables that they are the ones that just by creating news or by maybe refurbishing or upskilling up something, uh, uh, something new can solve, uh, can solve the issue. So when, when we talk about the labor, one of the, and this is like the, 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 the sad part of the conversation, one of the outcome of this pretty buildings and pretty famous buildings uh, that are published everywhere uh, and uh, students of architecture seem like, uh, okay, I want to become like that. I want to, I want to be famous like that. The, 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 the damage, the huge damage that these buildings are being created is this complete detachment from the reality. So even the, so the, the point of, uh, asking yourself, okay, who's going to, 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 to build what you design is probably the first step of taking back the responsibility is that if you embrace that, maybe you can also guarantee a better condition uh, for the labor because the, the design that you made, it's, it's, uh, it's labor friendly. I don't know how to say it, but it's... Um, so the, the, the point is design, it's, it, it needs to be logic, and, uh, in, my, in my opinion. And, and that logic means that it needs to be uh, solve the problems of uh, today's and, and the future. I don't know if I'm making any sense, probably not. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but the, 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 so I'm, I've been, despite of the fact I'm choosing, um, yeah. I choose to show these buildings that are very not use, uh, labor friendly. Uh, the point it was uh, the opposite. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think this this question of issues also to be opened up at various uh, various scales, because the way you presented that that how some of the uh, technological problems have a larger sort of either a, either a history geography 
uh, kind of a question and it is not just about solving that particular particular detail but the question lies somewhere else i think that's a that's a very important uh, i think idea to take uh, take back and especially when uh, the the proliferation of certain images like i was just uh, imagining or i was just thinking that why did the bilbao the bilbao effect is something that we talk about but the bilbao process or the bilbao sort of thinking is not something that can is on and that i think is the there lies a lies a problem that bilbao did something interesting but the effect that goes on rather than the sort of the, the larger process of thinking that went into the imagination and production of a of a building building like that and and maybe amrita that brings us back to uh, uh, questions of uh, questions of uh, media but also i think if you could further elaborate on on how some of our practices are constantly dealing with this uh, dealing with this question of changing times or dealing with this question of hyper changing times where where sort of the change is difficult like i think i think uh, kanji said uh, said this you know the catching up with reality and we are always sort of in a state of catching up rather than being able to uh, step back think because sometimes this utilitarian nature has got so has so much taken the better of us that to step back and say that you know what is it going to be in the next 20 years uh, for an architect for a young student who is entering first year today uh, uh, are are important important questions and what would you think of of this from your area of work also you've worked on somebody like sarabhai's uh, biography so you know uh, those certain histories of of thinking about uh, uh, futures i think when i said sara bhai amrita screen froze <laughs> but i think this is purely ah, coincidental yeah amrita you're back yes yes <laughs> okay <laughs> okay well let me actually you know because i wrote a book about a city uh, i was thinking of a lot of fundamental problems and then i went to a lot of architects seminars and and the very senior and you know brilliant architects and i kept hearing them say things like mm, but we can't question now the organization process and i kept thinking why not you know it's it's like they were here to talk about this project and about a private uh, public partnership and the government and they were excited about a new phenomenon i understand that so why can you not question the organization process why can't you why has it to be taken for granted why is it settled now it's not settled you know so um but it's it's not it's not architects alone i mean i i i see across the board whether it's science whether it's um well where is other say journalists for instance what was happening to journalism over the last 30 years i mean i wrote a book in 19 it came out in 1997 uh, which was republished recently which could see what was happening you know it's the larger forces that are changing the media and i kept i kept saying my colleague will fight for the rights of uh, you know mill workers they will fight for the rights of farmers but they were not able to fight for journalist rights because they didn't see what was coming and so some so i was trying to figure out what's happening what what has happened that um, and this is this is what i kind of i think that every time there is a kind of um, an economic um, sort of opening up as to give you an example i i came to journalism in the 80s where it was a very exciting time uh, you know a lot of investigative stories were being done and suddenly by 91 or so 90 it was all closed again and certain debate that we had started having i find today we are back to the yeah. basic we are, we are you know and i i'm i'm i feel very very kind of frustrated because i think we discussed all that 20 years ago and maybe it was discussed 50 years ago mm. but you're not building on it you know going back and starting all over again mm. without going you know like you're going deeper and starting again right you're going mm. back to that basic and then and, so, and again that would be demolished when again the media explodes again and again things are mm. simplified for a larger audience uh, i i think there's nothing wrong with simplification i think it's actually very exciting to use you know um, ways to Uh, to use media to make things uh, more exciting communicate better all that is great but why must it be dumbed down and i think what this does is that it makes everything 
thing like you you are only uh, invited to see what is up front very close to you like right up here hmm. you're not you're not uh, invited to look beyond so i think that yeah so now that i think first of all it has to be consciously resisted that's one thing and one one thing is this, this catching up with reality if you're flooded with useless information which is really i mean actually you can actually analyze it and it's all a marketing technique um it's a little complicated so i won't go into that but all this useless information is not innocent it's there to to it's not just for political reasons it's also to create a kind of a uh, consumption friendly um environment Thanks. where you know you you become kind of quite narrow and um, but uh, but anyway i think the a that can be that has to be consciously resisted but the other thing is that and i often you know i, I see people who are kind of younger and so it's so competitive now uh, certainly it has got more and more and they say but we can't do anything about it so why think about it and i say it doesn't matter if you can't do anything about it i think why can't you just think about it i mean at least be aware yeah, of it yeah 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 but i think that's really important to because everything can't be acted upon i i don't think um that's also another thing as if you can't change the world i think sometimes there are things that are say beyond your capacity so it's mm. okay but as long as you say i will know things that make me uncomfortable I will know things that are larger. I will know history. I will know. I will look mm. into the future. I mean, I will think bigger, or at least I will be aware that there is a bigger reality. And then, some way or the other, whenever you have a little, little power, or you know, you might think of a solution that brings these together. But mm. to cut it off is, I, I think, that's wrong. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Amrita. So can we have some questions from the students? Because I'm just opening the chat and uh, I don't see any questions there. But uh, Prakriti, are there are there questions that I'm not able to see or something? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Sudarshan. Yeah, hi, Kavan. Yes. Hi. Uh, I yeah. I just have a very general question to everybody uh, here. Uh, you know. Uh, my my concern is that uh, uh, this also includes a you know previous seminar yesterday what we had you know connecting all of those so you know uh, architect is kind of in the all of these conversation you know uh, the you know the blame is kind of put on the architect right say for example if you take an individual architect or any other building you know even we were discussing in your class that you know not every decision is in architect's hand right so so uh, so now now it's almost like you know it's saying you know it's almost like a situation where you do this you do that you do that also you do this also so are these are these uh, you know decisions what we are taking is not completely is an, in an, in our hand that is one point continuing that uh, question uh, so and also uh, and also for example uh, you know uh, 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 relating to your class also say for example luciana is talking about the you know the 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 construction defects or you know the the techniques or or it might be also directly related to labor and it also directly related to the skill that is there in the labor or the culture of labor in the whole city so those projects which he gave as an example would might have a different idea from a perspective of an architect right probably there are good things on the other side probably that project would have achieved something bigger in a larger picture or you know it would have achieved something else and and a and a problem of labor a problem of construction could be one of the problems that you know on the other side so if you look on the other side you know probably the architects uh, take on these projects would be something else so how do you deal with this uh, you know the problem of that everything is you know is the pro is, is the issue of an architect so i won't uh, i'll i'll open it up to any one of the speakers who could take up this question because you guys hear me anyways but i'll just i'll just uh, uh, make a very brief uh, entry here which is to which is to say that i don't think the presentations were about 
uh, uh, it, it's about broadening the scope of thinking rather than saying that there is an architect's point of view and now there is an X point of view and a Y perspective of seeing and a and a B side of uh, looking at uh, looking at something. I don't think it's I don't think that's the, that's the mode of uh, this seminar. I think the the question is opening up larger questions through these kind of uh, through these kind of samples so so for example luciano opens up this question that how do we think around around labor just that simple question he takes the he takes the route of looking at design the demands of design on a particular kind of a technology and was it able to be rendered uh, uh, in the design process or thought that was that was there but I think in the in the in the points that Kanji raised, or in the point that uh, uh, Tridip raised later, I think everybody extended that uh, that question into into broader questions of the ecosystem of, uh, of of living, or the politics of resources, or the or the straightforward questions of how uh, human resources are are distributed. What is the what is the way in which we understand human resources as labor? as a kind of bonded labor, even if there is no bonded labor, or what are the questions of equality that come in terms of questions of profession, in terms of questions of skill, but also in questions of, of, of social, social behavior, social patterns. So I think it is more about taking a set of questions and then seeing how much we can, we can expand them. And I think as, as Amrita said, it is, it, the point is to be able to think about something. And then the question comes: How much, or what can you, what can you address? But Luciano, if you would like to expand on, on yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, I think the the point is, I mean, what is uh, very useful to um, probably uh, answer your question. Um, if you see um, the um, the majority of the building I show you, they come out of a competition. Uh, so the good things of a competition that you can actually see uh, the original drawings um, and the original drawings of, uh, for instance, the, the, the building, um, the museum in Rome are not taking all these layers of um, complexity, one of which I highlighted, which is the, the ability in understanding what is what is the available labor in a place where you where you design. So if you see the building, the original drawings of uh, the the museum in 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 Rome, they're extremely ethereal. They they are almost uh, concept drawings, despite of the fact that at the at the, at the, mm, the the competition was asked for a one to two to one hundred scale. So something where you already kind of know the details but if you see these buildings sorry if you see these drawings and then you see what happened you analyze the building and then you see in terms of defects what happens you can start identify the gaps so the gaps in the in the design conceptual it's it's not a gap. of course the a building engineer or a civil engineer came and discussed with zaha adit definitely with her but with one of the uh, architects working with her it's like how to make that detail and that that specific detail uh, the, the detail that where it rains through it's not of architectural investigation we would have a different museum we would have a museum that has it's more in line with um uh, with the labor and therefore um the fabrication process would be more consistent therefore we know uh um, defective experience so it's it's more uh, it's more about highlighting the power of design and all these layers that we probably missing in uh, in uh, uh, in the action of design today and as you will be a new generation of architect maybe you want to uh, you know make your uh, design narrative more complicated and get complicated or or more um, uh, future uh, oriented and get this extra layer on board. So it still has that kind of a focal point of, of the responsibility of, of the design. Utsun is the same. 
uh, the drawings of the of the opera house, the original okay. competition drawings of the opera house. There, uh, and, um, lines. And sometimes it, uh, it works well. Sometimes it doesn't. But still, it's we still talk about design. Thanks, Luciano. Can we have some other questions from some other students? Since you're going to be dealing with all these points that we have happily been talking about soon in your studio. Yeah, Surya and Mehul, right? <laughs> Yes. Hello. Yes, Nitin. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Nitin. And did I go mute in between? No. No. You're fine. You can oh. continue speaking. Okay. Okay. So, um, th thank you first of all uh, for presenting all your ideas. Uh, just as a continuation to the previous question, uh, today, uh, as we are discussing all of this, I also want to uh, ask about uh, computational design and. Today we are dealing with a lot of technology. Um, do you think uh, technology? We are at, the, uh, at this juncture where we can actually solve so many problems uh, using computation, and you know, probably uh, come to a conclusion like solve uh, to an extent that we might not uh, come to such problems. You know, because uh, I think we have been transiting. Uh, there's a large uh, transition from before digital era to the new digital era and how is it actually changing the industry? Because, uh, I mean, as we have seen, uh, Zaha Deed's, this thing, it's largely a computational based approach. And it is kind of alarming even to see that, you know, after all that, and today I'm seeing from your presentation that you're finding out all these sort of construction uh, errors or whatever those things are. So how, how is it changing the way we are looking at construction in the industry? Um, I think when, when we talk about computational design, there is a huge wall that separates computational design, parametric design, and the construction industry. And that's where the, um, uh, that's where, you know, high, I'm, I'm, I'm workshopping here, but like robots and, uh, um, and highly uh, qualified prefabrication system enter into the place to have this very pristine and uh, the natural preparation of manufacturing now, printing or with the digital printing, it's the natural of computation. Uh, of, of the environment, and then the final outcome of the digital environment is already a machine creating that thing in the in the, in the real life. Where in the construction industry, uh, all the examples that we see at that stage are resilience um, to uh, I don't know um, uh, services uh, or. Um, any type of sophisticated integration between uh, so i i and until and i i don't see that as um you see, as i said the construction industry is really really reluctant because that, that means that embracing parametric design into the construction that means losing a lot of jobs uh so in Italy, in the World War II, for instance, uh, after World War II, uh, the, Italy was devastated, and um, uh, economically and all the infrastructure. And the government decided um, to have to push the the, the system of a craft-led construction industry for increasing the employment rate, and we're still dealing with that. So we still have that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, very craft-led approach with medium-sized and small-sized companies, 
because of a political decision uh, related to employment rates. So it's a very, I don't, basically, I don't have the answer <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell. But currently, we have this huge wall. And, and, and I'm always, um, I'm always tease my colleagues that talk about um, the, 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 the teach computational design, where it's like, okay, give me something more than a pavilion. Mm. Give me, let's, let's uh, bring that in. And there have been some good examples, especially in restoration, I think, especially in refurbishment. I think that's a very um, interesting area when we, when we want to use resources uh, in of materials and retrofitting existing buildings. I think that would be probably the niche where um, um, digital fabrication would be more useful. Thanks, Luciano. But I would also like uh, either Amrita or Kanchi to come in at this point also because I think this uh, raises this I think, uh, hey. disconnected. Fine. Okay. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. But I'm back. I, I, well, she's she's back. She's back. Yeah. This uh, because I think the question that uh, Nitin raises is also has been has been part of some of the things we've already been discussed. Uh, a certain imagination of technology that is only part of the technological process, that is only part of a certain, a certain imagination of science and progress, but, but not connecting technology essentially, uh, that technology also is rooted within certain sets of histories, contexts, uh, 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 et cetera. Like for example, the, 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 the example that I, a very easy example that I gave of Hall of Nations, that a concrete uh, space frame wouldn't be possible. Uh, without the sort of architect and engineer consciously or subconsciously realizing that there is a certain kind of a possibility, uh, whether it's innovation, whether it's possibility, all these options that are available in the spirit of engineering that existed in the country at some point in time, but also access to certain kind of patronage and access to certain kind of, uh, certain kind of labor. But also I think uh, in the Central Vista project, we see a certain employment of technology being the solver of problems. And in that sense, anything that comes in the way of technology should not stand because technology is obvious, this sort of neutral space, this in international and universal space, which will solve problems without taking sides. So this kind of an imagination of, uh, of technology itself, I think, uh, is something that needs to be needs to be thought through. Uh, uh, I would say, and as I said, I would love Amrita or Kanj, or love to listen to them or their views on this. Actually, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like Amrita. to say something. Uh, you know, using um, I wrote a book about Vikram Sarabhai, you know, a biography of Vikram Sarabhai, and he was, you know, of course, he founded the space program. Uh, so he he was a scientist, he was a technologist, but you know, those days were just different. I think the specialization, things were not so kind of uh, narrowly. You didn't have to be just one or the other. There was a, there was a, a general, um, there was a kind of more rounded understanding of the world. Uh, you know, Sarabhai was, was listened to music. He, uh, uh, he had, he read widely. Uh, he, he hobnobbed with all kinds of people, uh, you know, so, so his thinking was not, not solution driven, technolo technological solution driven, though he was a fine technologist who, you know, founded uh, something as vast and complicated as a space program. So clearly he was not lacking in any way. But the kind of vision that he gave it, it, it was so kind of um, enduring that today we are actually kind of still uh, you know, fulfill in ma fulfilling in many ways parts of that vision. We're still driven by that vision. So I think that that, and coming from the media, I find that that that's gone. That space is gone. It's like um, you are a, a reporter, and then there is academic, and that in between space of just general of, of essay writing, of, of people just being concerned with issues of all kinds uh, in a very um, creatively written way. You know, it doesn't have to be sort of, um, I, I think that space has to be recovered in some way. Thanks. Thanks, Amrit. 
Uh, also, in in a sense, Homi Bhava is a character, a uh, character like that who's investing in sort of the modern arts, the ancient arts, simultaneously with investing in architecture for a building, uh, for a for a particular kind of a design, etc. The slight difference is that Sarabhai also did that, but um, I think Sarabhai's vision is kind of included all. It was very oh. strongly for communication, space technology for uplifting, you know. Ha, 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 ha. Right, right. Yeah, thanks. Kanchi, would you like to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, whatever I could gather of the question, really, I mean, uh, sorry, I got cut off. Um, but I, I think one of the things that is happening, especially when it comes to uh, you know issues of environment, uh, I mean the the limits of technological fixes are really out there. There's evidence of that, like or or the the kind of innovations that you're seeing in terms of technological responses are are I mean at one level being debated, are or at another level also look a little absurd, because like for instance you take the uh, the wicked problem of air pollution in Delhi. Uh, and now there have been many source apportionment studies to say which uh, which are the factors that kind of contribute to air pollution in Delhi, you know, from uh, from construction to waste waste burning to uh, you know all uh, crop burning, all those kinds of factors or vehicular pollution. But for the last year and a half, one of the things that is being really pushed through as a solution for the air pollution problem in Delhi is these large, tall smog towers, which is basically, you know, uh, your uh, household air purifiers like 100 times over uh, and planted in the mid middle of the city. So like, you know, uh, a crowded market like Rajpat, Rajpat Nagar or in the, you know, Lutians Delhi, you'll have one big, large smog tower, very beautiful looking uh, smog towers. So I think the limits of the technology are really being tested because the uh, if you don't want to touch the factors contributing to the problem, then you have the technology trying to give you these absurd solutions. You know, for instance, uh, uh, when you come when it comes to tree felling, you know, uh, nobody wants to really deal with the uh, the idea of actually trees being in those spaces, fourteen thousand trees, twenty thousand trees. So you say, okay, you cut these and you plant ten times over on the flood plains of a river, which is not meant for uh, planting those trees. But then the floodplains of the river actually are, uh, you know, also being thought of, thought of to actually cut, uh, cut a railway line through. You know, so then he said, okay, okay, let's move it from here, we move it somewhere else. So the, the technofix solutions uh, to some of these problems, there are the limits are, the evidence of the limits are very much out there. Uh, so I think we'll have to really go back to figuring out uh, or uh, go back rather or just acknowledge that there are certain contributing factors which need to be addressed. If you don't address this, then you keep coming up with nice tall smog towers to address the air pollution problem in Delhi, you know, which, which the highest court of the country is really pushing through. You know, set it up in the next 10 months, all smog towers in the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how technology also becomes an easy tool for legal systems because they are the easiest sometimes to handle in a, in a certain way. But, but thanks, Kanchi and Amrita. And, Maybe I, uh, Surya and Mehul, you want to want to round it up. But be, before I hand it over to both of you, uh, Kanchi, Amrita, and Luciano, thank you very much for three uh, wonderful, provocative uh, presentations. I think they serve the purpose of the seminar and the context of the studio. I think beautifully, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, building my own series of thoughts and and questions and conversations with uh, the three of you and the audience uh, audience here. So thank you all very much. And, and Surya and Mehul, over to you. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Please. I, it's 4.59. Maybe we can take one more question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bhakti. Uh, so uh, this question is to uh, Amrita. Uh, I really want to, uh, could you throw some light on how social media has change the way we are consuming our everyday life. Uh, what, from, from my perspective, one thing is that the way uh, as architects or architecture students, we are consuming our, uh, uh, consuming social media, we are extremely uh, you know, bombarded with images, images, images. And we spend a lot of time on Instagram and Facebook. 
and uh, how how do you think that this has changed the way we are uh, also looking at the world in general uh, and you've already you've you you've, uh, you've seen the transition from a tv uh, channel media to uh, social media where uh, it's it can be even more biased because we select the people we want to follow and listen to it's not like as we see it on tv whatever comes we take it right so social media has become more of a choice based uh, system right um so i think you know a lot of lot of people have when television came people said it was an idiot box when social media comes people think that it's you know responsible for all the bad in the world i think it's technology is never you know you, you it's what you make of it and uh, you can you could have used it very differently and i think what social media does what i think um it does is actually it continues from the past it's not something one should look at it as something completely new it continues the same trend that uh, that has been kind of uh, you know prevailing uh, it just makes it a little louder so what it does is the trends i think are distract it's it, it extremely addictive it's distracting uh, and as you say it's kind of quick right you have to have fit everything into very short um, sentences and uh, uh, you know your text has to be small and very visually driven etc but i think i think i look at it slightly differently i think that if it is if it is changing us uh, i think a lot of people say oh people don't read how terrible i think it, it's it's fine I, I don't think people have to get get their knowledge one way or another i think you know it, it, it I, i don't have a problem with that let let put it that way we will be a more visually driven society for sure but what i um what i think is that uh what is happening is that we are projecting ourselves we are constantly marking Amrita, we are losing you. This wider trend of selling. Everything is about. Uh, no, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I was saying that that what what social media does is uh, in a way. everyone is projecting themselves uh, and and in a way you can say that it's become more democratic that many more people now can present themselves to the world um i just think that that one has to resist resist many things the things that one feels are not the way we want to go uh but i, I don't think by itself social media is good or bad you know it's it's one has to just understand that it's continuing certain trends uh and and one has to then resist it if one doesn't want to for trade to those trends so i don't think it's different i'm just saying that's what i mean television the scale the scale keeps increasing that's all thanks amrita thank you thank you any other questions from the students or anybody anybody has anything else so if i may add Please, as possible. So, uh, just an extension of Nitin's question towards Amrita and Nita. He was also talking about social media, but we recently uh, get this news that uh, Facebook has been like in favor of certain ideologies or certain things like that. So, essentially, media as an, as you said, an ideological driven forces. How, as a citizen, like an average citizen, how can we uh, get past these ideologies? Like, who is a more factual inquiry uh, in those terms so if you could shed some light on that yeah it's it's a very difficult situation i think um in terms of uh, how easy the growth of the media makes uh, makes manipulation possible you, you know it it it's a hard thing to fight now i mean it's it's too big and we should have put in processes in place uh, a long time ago you know 
uh, if journalists, or I, I don't know, but you know, the citizens should have gotten up at the dumbing down, you don't like the civilization, but anyway, here we are. Um, so we are already in a situation where we are um, in tough times, where, you know, we can be manipulated using all this new technology. How does one find, there are many experiments being conducted in the world. Uh, I think it's in Finland, I, I think that was where. I think they're kind of now actually starting to educate people in how to, uh, you know, judge fake news from uh, how to kind of judge what's, what's completely inaccurate. And that's one kind of process where, I mean, in India, you have now people actually, you know, devoting themselves full, full time to kind of, um, uh, so the first thing, another thing, if you see another trend over the last few years, you see the growth of, uh, while journalism has lost credibility, you see the rise of all these what were supposed to be comic shows on Oliver, um, uh, you know, people who are actually kind of, and it's interesting that now you go to them for what's happening, you actually go to them, they are more credibility. Yeah. And I think this has happened just because the media just went crazy. And so, you know, even the, you, you, there was no way to sort of, um, uh, bring it back to keel within, uh, and so these these kind of uh, things came up. But I think what one has to start doing is not say here is the solution today, or I'm so helpless and I can't think of a solution. I'm just going to not think about it. I think one has to, uh, if one that's exactly what I was kind of saying that if one says okay, this is the problem, this is how we arrived at it, uh, and this is the size of of you know what we are dealing with and uh, and then just be with it you know be for a while while with it um, then I think you know slowly because more and more people are concerned about it now more and more people have understood that something really big and dangerous is happening so that's all I can say there is no there is no immediate solution that I see thanks I think the, the, the solution is, I think, very rightly pointed out that uh, countries which are beginning to kind of address this at a governance level, which means they're getting it part into the education formats, into curriculum, somehow potentially telling us uh, how to handle it. It's like when you need to read, when you need to, you know, how you learn the alphabets, then you make words, and then you, then you get a grasp of all this. It's a similar way. I guess media also, we've never been taught media. We've always been, it, it always comes to us. It is, it, it, and we deal with it. And just like I think Kanchi was also telling us about, we're always catching up, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, in the law, in, in, the, in the way we uh, do with law, environmental law. It's always playing catching up. And I think media seems to be in a similar kind of way that we're also just living it with, we don't have anything. We seem to think it is outside of us and we have no control. But what we don't realize is, as consumers, we actually make it also, you know. And I think it's, it's very interesting that, uh, that uh, this, this uh, and I think if there are other no questions, we will uh, I, thank um, Ah, please, it, through them. No, I, I you know, um, two things. Um, I mean, um, one that when we, when we are faced with what we see as very large structures uh, of modern corporates, uh, we seem to feel incapacitated as to, you know, we feel powerless. Uh, imagine, um, um, imagine yourself in an even more unequal world. Uh, imagine yourself to be not free. Right now, you, you feel that your freedoms are being curtailed or your freedoms are being directed in a certain way. There is a manipulation that happens of ideas, opinions, emotions. But imagine a situation that you're not free. And your first thing that you need to do is to establish the legitimacy of freedom itself. And we forget that we did that only 60 years ago. Right? Uh, uh, I think there is great things to be learned if you will really to start paying attention to what this I think by every account, one of the most magnificent uh, struggles to, to think of freedom, to attain it, to deepen it, to acquire it, uh, it was just 
I mean, it's, 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 it's among, in the, the history of modern world, it has few patterns and other things that we can learn from it. Um, and, and so one is that realize that we actually have the capacity as society and as people to deal with far greater unjust structures. And we've done it. Right? We are, I mean, we find ourselves, people like Amrita and me, more so than you, uh, um, uh, find ourselves you know, redundant, but need not be so. I mean, not that, you know, either she has given up or I, we both, uh, or, or anybody gives up that easily. But the point really is that we forget that individuals matter. We, we can create, I mean, for example, for example, um, if, we, if we are a lot, one thing that perturbs a lot of us is the violence of the social media. We have created that as one of the most violent spaces. Now, it's not been created by the corporate. It benefits from it. It, it furthers it. It might actually employ people to create more violent discourse, but we, we consume it, we participate in it. There was something that we were told not long ago, which was to say, if something is so unjust, so violent, there is a very simple thing to do, which is to say, I will not play this game. Which is to say, non-cooperation. It's a very powerful idea. Think about it. No, not cooperating with what we think is evil is an extremely powerful idea. Uh, and I think Ashwin and, and everybody else, you need to think about how do we cooperate and not cooperate with, with forces that we find representing vice, representing certain kind of evil. So that's one. Second is that we also have the same technology allows us to create alternatives. The same printing press was used by Indians uh, to speak of freedom. The number of newspapers which came up and pamphlets which came up during those 60 years would put the te television channels of India to shame today. Every town had its little uh, leaflet that went out. Uh, 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 which, which we challenge the might of the empire and challenge it rather successfully. So we, so the technology uh, that's available and the, our ability to use it is also something that gives us the capacity to create alternatives. It's just that we find when we think of these very large structures, we find ourselves uh, very small. Uh, but if we don't think in terms of very large structures, but the everydayness of it, uh, I will not consume these tweet. I will not consume. I will not participate in, an, in a violent discourse. Uh, uh, I will try and create a safe space. I will try and create a non rapacious space. Now, all of these things are things that we need to do. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to take away from what Amrita said and what the others have said. Thank you, Trudeep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, uh, the connections that uh, that got uh, made uh, between uh, right from what uh, Luciano started off with talking about how how uh, non-standard buildings. You know, I mean, it actually uh, interests us that you know when we took it non-standard buildings, we begin to think, oh, okay, this is one of those bisco, and so we kind of beyond a point, we don't give it a thought except image. But sometimes they set up certain kinds of innovations that go forward into the market. Along with that, there is also this fear, and which he also very clearly elicited about the idea that in Europe or most of those parts of the Western developed world, architects are seen to make beautiful buildings. I mean, they're called to make in pretty things. And so, again, whether our agency is about being pretty or is there, I think these are questions that. Uh, right from uh, how we see ourselves to, and then from there we go to Kanchi where she actually uh, talks very clearly about telling us about the politics of framing, you know, and, and, and I think it's very, very interesting 
how a debate is how how a debate is framed in 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 uh, and and the whole politics of framing this you know uh, and and that we are all playing catch up we are still we are we are the the idea that uh, uh, and why is it and to think whether why is it that the system tells us that okay if you have a problem you report a problem but are we not rational enough or are we do not do we not have the information to be able to judge something before it happens you know these are questions that are opening up to us that why do we have to have a post de facto analysis of a problem versus an ability to be able to visualize the 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 future and i think a lot of us architects would be in positions where we will be building buildings putting up stuff that is for the future because when we do it we are doing it for time ahead and it is our ability or inability to be able to process this and i think at the end of it do not keep the media away understand it work with it work it to your advantage and as tridip says if you feel it's violent it's wiseful you have a choice too but i think there are far more advantages of converting it to your become making it your tool rather than letting it become a murdoch you know like as uh, amrita said murdoch murdochization or something like that i think the whole world last 40 years we had a certain kind of media but i think hopefully that spirit needs to be uh taken away or harnessed for our own good because i think there are equally good things that are happening on media a lot of good stuff that we know about right now what we are doing here and so how do we harness what we think is useful to us and take it forward so i think uh, this this is a lot of these various dots that we will as we go forward and program our own futures um i think these are the discussions that will help these become building blocks in our minds and may pan out over years so thank you so much uh, luciano for this it must be really late for you out there and thank you for taking time and being with us uh, it was wonderful uh, i think uh, once when we came to know about your work when we started looking at it i think it's there's a lot of material in your work that we will be using in our classes in other classes too because you see one of the biggest advantages is post occupancy studies what we do for spaces we we rarely have buildings or information which do analysis of built buildings in problems of the buildings and we keep designing and we keep designing and we keep designing but we don't have knowledge about all that stuff that's already been built over the last 70 80 years not 100 so i think wonderful uh, getting to know you and getting this opportunity thank you uh, thank you It was thank a pleasure you. to meet you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and thank you, Kanchi, for kind kind of opening uh, this clearly as to our position in this, uh, and and as where we stand, and what laws, and and uh, you know not to get defeated, but to keep you know to be there, to hang in there, and it'll it matters to just be there. And I think thank you for uh, taking time, and I'm sure we will. we will keep in touch thank you thank you and amrita wonderful uh, to hear you again on uh, media and uh, to be able to uh, to open how this game how this game works in a way and uh, it can be as brutal but it can also be as useful and it depends on how uh, but important is to engage and i think what you really leave us is do not disregard is it engage with it and i think uh, i'm sure uh, and especially this generation is i mean he's hooked on to it and i think their concerns do come from deeply because they see themselves it's as part of their oxygen you know it's it's, it's part oxygen so <laughs> so it's important for them to figure this oxygen for them i guess so thank you uh, thank you trudip also for being there uh, wonderful yeah i mean i'm glad uh, we could have uh, uh your views and as usual interesting and uh I, I i need i need to be bribed as you know i know <laughs> i know <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, i i i keep telling these people amrita they don't understand that i'm a gujarati i'm eminently buyable nobody offers me anything 
you're a you're a Gujarati and an Ahmedabadi. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. She knows absolutely. them well. She knows them all well. <laughs> yeah. And I, I keep saying that you know, I'm viable, but you know, I mean, these people are very very good. My <laughs> colleagues are very good. Uh, and Kaiwan, thank you so much for you know this. This is a challenging task, and you know you had all these people who had these wonderful views on their areas, but to be able to connect and you know be able to make sense to the students about where all this comes and and figures in in our space, uh, lovely. And I think uh, thank you so much, Kaiwan, for taking. Thank time. you, thank you, thanks, studio. Thank you, everybody, again. Uh, Mehul, if you have anything to add, if I've left out anything. No, no, I think there is enough said today. <laughs> what the, 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 the feeling that I have the most, this thing is between uh, Luciano, Kanchi, Amrita and Dridip. They have shown us a very hard hitting mirror to ourselves because we as architects, uh, we are very notorious to, you know, always start either architect or architecture with a capital A. Okay, and we in our course itself, we have listed labor as a resource rather than people with human rights. Okay, so this is a very hard hitting mirror, at least for me. So, I mean, you know, I'm still processing that, but you know, it's been a wonderful evening. And uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'll ask Prakriti to just you know, have a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, along with the rest of the audience, I would like to thank our panelists and our um, moderator for engaging us in such an insightful discussion today. Uh, as students, we're often conditioned to uh, find simple and seemingly straightforward cause-effect relationships when we see the past and try and figure out how we've reached, where we've reached. Uh, today and uh, while thinking of the present uh, and looking at the future, especially now, we find it really hard to find sort of solid ground to stand on and to align our uh, thoughts. So I think today's discussion really grabbed the bull by its horns and helped us situate ourselves better in the current context. So now we can definitely hope for a better informed and uh, more appropriate blue uh, drafting of the blueprint for looking ahead. So thank you again for your time and your wonderful insights and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, bye Amrita. Bye Kanchi. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye Luciano. Thank you bye. so much. Bye bye. Bye bye bye. Thank you. Bye.